participant chers participantes et à cette conférence de l'ERAB. Une première en Amérique du Nord et je suis particulièrement très fier que cela se passe chez nous à Montréal et à l'EG UCAM. I warmly welcome you all to this 21st edition of the URAM conference that is organized in cooperation with the Ecole des Sciences de la Gestion of the Université du Québec à Montréal. In 2019, when our School of Management were chosen to host such a prestigious event in the field of management sciences, it was a great honor for us, a real mark of recognition, an exciting opportunity to establish new bridges of knowledge between Europe and North America. We immediately begin to prepare to welcome you at Montreal. When this plan was scuttled by the COVID-19 pandemic, our local organizing committee remained fully engaged and made a significant effort to support the European Academy of Management in its initiative to redesign the conference as a successful online event. In a recent article published in the journal Nature points out that virtual conferences may not be perfect and may lack the privacy of physical gathering. It may be true, but every uncertainty comes with its specific opportunity. Let's take advantage of the opportunities offered by online conference which helps democratize access to science and research and allows participants to remain interactive. Take advantage of online availability and switch to binge research mode. Learning to deal with the new challenges, risk and uncertainties that we face every day will help prepare the ground for reshaping capitalism for a sustainable world, which is the theme of this conference. The theme of the conference invites scholars, but also practitioners to share their specific knowledge that stimulate sustainable economic growth while continuing to create new jobs and economic opportunities for all serve society, protect the environment, strengthen the global response to climate change, and address new threats that may arise because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Needless to say, these ambitious long-term goals cannot and will not be achieved if we continue to work in silos and without paying attention to each other's views on each specific aspect that is responsible for the formation of these silos. Let's challenge the mental model known as confirmation bias, which is the tendency of individuals to cherry pick information that comfort their existing beliefs or ideas. First identified by the ancient Greeks in the history of the Peloponnesian War, this mental model was later explained by the influential French philosopher Henri Bergson, who wrote that the eye sees only what the man is prepared to comprehend. But also by the British philosopher who wrote that the human understanding, when he has once adopted an opinion, as it has been a received opinion or as being agreeable to itself, draws all things else to support and agree with it. In other words, how can academics affiliated with various schools of thought, businesses, 
large and small, and governments work together for a better and more sustainable future. The path to this goal is not one size fits all, and no single entity or group of entities, whether researchers, corporations, or governments, possess the true, the absolute truth, nor all of the knowledge either. This is why the theme of this conference invites all parties concerned to engage in a fair dialogue and to address openly and courageously the dichotomies between their views. For example, competition and cooperation, financial entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, artificial intelligence and human intelligence, technology and privacy issue, the need of businesses and the demand of the society, the creation of economic and social value by companies, and finally, global thinking and local specificities. To further highlight this initiative, this year, the local committee made available to participants eight labs for practitioners that took place yesterday and which brought together various panelists, some from academia and others from the business community. I hope you enjoy this activity. I am convinced that this conference, which brings together more than a thousand participants for discussing these topics, will help advance our understanding of the future of our businesses, our people, and our planet. I would like to express my gratitude to our conference co-chair, Camelia Dimitriou, and our colleagues on the local organizing committee for their devoted and sustained efforts over the past 12 months. Un merci très spécial et très chaleureux à ma très chère la co-présidente de cette conférence, Camélia Dimitriou, ainsi que le comité local qui ont toutes et tous travaillé d'arrache-pied pour que cette conférence soit un succès. I also thank all the URAM teams who fully contributed to this conference, the URAM executive team, the members of the executive committee, and the chairs and co-chair of the strategic interest group. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank the track chairs, symposium proponents, lab organizers, and panelists, reviewers, and authors who will bring this conference to life for three days, making it a memorable event. Je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous une excellente conférence. I wish you all an excellent conference and hopefully this pandemic will end one day and I will be glad to personally welcome you in our very beautiful city of Montreal. In the meantime, let me show you in a short video for those who have never visited Montreal, how beautiful and well balanced the city of Montreal is one of the most inspiring cities in the world, either for international events, nightlife, street art, but also the best student city in the Americas. Enjoy. I'll now share my screen. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Euram 2021. My name is Katrin Möslein and I'm the current president of the European Academy of Management. And I'm really impressed by the energy I experience at this Euram conference. Well, already on Monday at the doctoral colloquium, on Tuesday, we experienced it at the labs. This morning from the early morning coffee at 7 a.m. Central European summertime and still heating up in the best sense. And thank you so much, Komlan. Merci beaucoup. Um, you are not just a great local host. You also gave us a wonderful welcome to Montreal. And for sure, the thank you also extends to Camelia, to your whole team, to everyone who engaged in Montreal in welcoming us in such a nice way. We almost feel being there and truly enjoy the experience of dreaming to come to your university, the University of Quebec or Montreal. And for me, it's easy to imagine being at your school because I vividly remember the place. Immediately after finishing my PhD in the year 2000, there was an ASAC IFSAM conference, a conference by the Canadian Association jointly with the International Federation for Scholarly Associations of Management at the University of Quebec at Montreal. And this was a great experience. And I remember it as a game changer in my journey, in the journey of my life, because I decided to stay in academia at this conference. So it's great to be back at your university. It's great to uh, jointly open this conference. Uh, the conference at the time was a multilingual conference with sessions not just in English, but French, Spanish, and I really liked it. It was a conference with many keynotes and approaching the speakers after their talks also created links for a lifetime. It was in the year 2000. At a time, the European Academy of Management had not even come to life. But this conference at Montreal gave me all the energy to engage in important academic developments. And the great chance came just one year later, when in 2001, the foundation of the European Academy of Management happened. And in Barcelona, I experienced exactly that. I experienced it as an open invitation to contribute. An open invitation by the founding academics of the European Academy of Management. And that was for me really the start of a perfect academic journey. For those who were with Euram for quite some time, remember Barcelona in 2001 with Jean Ricard, Stockholm, 
in 2002 with Per Olof Berg, Milan, Italy, in 2003 with Donatella Deperu, 2004, St. Andrews in Scotland with Peter McKiernan, 2005 in Munich, Germany with Ralph Reichwald, enough and for sure lots of beer. Oslo, Norway in 2006 with Johann Olleisen and Ken Friedman, Paris in France with Thomas Durand in 2007, and you can imagine I could go on and on. Now Euram is it in, in its 21st year, still extending an open invitation to everyone who wants to contribute, who wants to get more deeply involved, who wants to join our journey and get deeply involved in co-creating our community. There are many directions for Euram to grow, to evolve, to develop over time. And there are many ways for all of us to get more deeply involved and work together beyond the boundaries of our schools, of our universities, of our countries. So aiming for a sustainable world, the theme of this conference, dealing with the consequences of a global pandemic, focusing even stronger on supporting the next generation of management researchers, working on current and future research outlets and publication platforms to professionalize or change the rules of the game of our disciplines, reaching out to a broader set of stakeholder groups, working together on crafting joint European research projects, or reaching out to fields beyond management research. Throughout this conference, we all will meet about 1,200 delegates from 60 countries participating in 14 symposia and presenting, discussing, and reflecting research from close to 800 papers. You know all that, and you will find all this information on the platform. Let me therefore focus in my short introduction just on three major points that really matter to me. Let's call it three learnings from the first 20 years of Europe. First, academia is a collaborative game. It's a team sport, even if it sometimes looks like an individual competitive hunt for positions, for careers, for paper slots or grant money. Yes, in our individual small worlds, it might look highly competitive. But I want to stress the point, if we want to see it as competitive, we will see it as competitive. I do not recommend so. My learning from 21 years after finishing my PhD is it's a collaborative game. Academia is only as good as our joint contributions are. And for me, this year's conference platform is a wonderful metaphor for academia as a whole. You might have seen that there is a gaming element on the platform. This is a competition. You can collect points, you can fight, you can win, and in the end, you can be the king of the platform. Isn't that fun? And I thank our Vice President Conferences, ITOR, for making this happen and giving us this experience. It shows us that this tiny competitive mechanism is just a way to keep us all engaged in this wonderful community. You would never take the competition for the conference. You would never take the mechanism for the world. Let us not take the competitive elements in academia and in our discipline as academia. Academia is a community effort challenges, competitions, and the like are just part of it. If we not do let them dominate our world, they won't. Academia is a collaborative game. Second, by entering academia, you start making a difference to the game. Be a game changer. This week, I spent already quite some time with doctoral students, with newcomers, with first timers, Last year, 
the pandemic made us all being first timers in a virtual event. Now we are all first timers in virtual Montreal. And after the pandemic, I guess we will all be first timers in the new normal. Let's take it as a call to get involved and to try to make a difference. Let's create ideas, what we can learn from our first timer experience. Let's create the future of Euram with a fresh mindset. It is wonderful to be a first timer. This is when we learn most. Unfortunately, being with Euram for so many years, 21 in my case, makes us forget how wonderful it is, this learning experience, and therefore meet with the first timers to start asking the right questions and no longer accept everything in our field as a given. And third point, let's start here and now. Let's work on the here and now. Let us make this conference a great collaborative experience. If each and every one of us plans to make one additional unplanned contribution to the conference, something that makes this conference experience even better, even if it's just for one person, connecting with a new face, bridging contacts around topics, whatever comes to your mind, just lean back and think about how you can make your contribution to make this conference even better. This would be about 1,200 collective improvement efforts, 1,200 positive contributions, 1,200 steps towards working together as a community even stronger, even better than before. Let us be inspirational for each other let us make Euram the place to be for talent development, for idea creation, for having impact, you name it. Let us start here and now. Thus, by one, two, and three, by looking at academia as a collective game, by making a difference and being a game changer, maybe by taking the view of a first timer, and by starting here and now at the conference, we will together create the future of Europe. Welcome to Europe 2021. After this short introduction, I would like to ask today's keynote speaker, Joshua Benjo, on stage. Because it's now my great pleasure and honor to announce our opening keynote speaker. Welcome, Joshua Bencho. This keynote will open our horizon. It will bridge beyond our comfort zone. It reaches far outside management research. And by doing so, it can already help us all to feel like first timers. Joshua Bencho, the rock star of artificial intelligence research. Welcome on stage. Well, for sure, Joshua Bencho doesn't need an introduction. Well, introducing you just feels a bit paradoxical. But it shows how happy and proud we are to have you with us today at the Europe opening event. Born in Paris, at home in Montreal, a faculty member of the University in Montreal since, I think, 1993, head of MILA, the Montreal Institute, for learning algorithms, the dream place for everyone in AI, as I know from all my colleagues in computer science. Well, and in 2018, Professor Bencho received the Turing Award, the Nobel Prize in Computing together with Geoffrey Hinton and Jan Lecan. He's an officer of the Order of Canada, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the Royal Society, and Joshua, you know I could go on and on and on for hours, but I will immediately stop. The floor is yours. We are looking forward to your keynote. All right. Thank you for the kind words. Um, let me try to share my screen.
this working for you? Yes. All right. So um, today I want to tell you about um, things that are a bit tangential to my own research. Uh, my own research um, is, is really on machine learning and algorithms. Um, but it, as I have been uh, interested more and more over the last few years in how we could deploy AI in uh, socially beneficial ways, um, I've been uh, confronted to some challenges and I wanted to share a bit of the thoughts I've, um, I've had about um, uh, how this could be done better in the future. So the, the conference is about AI for good, uh, AI for social good, um, and the innovation incentives that I think we need to put in place better to make uh, those uh, uh, you know, great potentials happen. So um, I will start with something that sounds a little bit abstract, but is really at the heart of uh, my discussion. Um, in fact, it's connected to a classical problem in AI. If you have a, you build a robot and um, you'd like to program it so that it will act um, in a way that's aligned with the interests of the humans, um, how do you do that? It's difficult because you might um, uh, give the robot some objective and it's not going to fit really well what people would have liked to see. Um, and so there's going to be a mismatch. There's going to be an alignment problem. Um, now, it turns out, and it's quite an interesting uh, parallel, that there is a um, similar alignment problem between the corporate behavior uh, of uh, firms and what society would like them to do, uh, you know, which is to be acting in a way that's aligned with human values and, and, and the public good, which we try to embody in, in, in law, for example, and regulations. Um, and somehow we succeed only partially in this. Um, corporations often manage to act legally, but sometimes in ways which can hurt society. So, um, yeah, this is a problem much bigger than, than the problem of AI, but AI is potentially making this mismatch a worse problem because uh, it's a tool that we're building and that tool is powerful and it's gonna be even more powerful in the future. Um, and you know, in the same way that when you build a robot, um, you might be concerned that it acts in a way that's dangerous for you, um, this concern becomes greater if the robot has more power, uh, if you know it can kill, for example. So uh, yeah, uh, I think similarly in society, as we build more powerful technological tools, it becomes even more important to uh, think carefully about this alignment issue between corporations and um, and, and the, 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 the needs of society. Um, so let's, let's think about it in a way that's a little bit geometric first, because I'm a computer scientist and uh, I like math. Um, so, so think about an economic agent um, that our firm, but you know, it could be any economic agent and Somehow, because of the rules of the game, as we say, um, it's optimizing uh, a form of self-interest. For example, the uh, discounted expected future profit um, in the case of many corporations. Um, so its behavior is going to gradually move towards trying to increase that. So there's like a gradient field at any moment. I mean, those. This is not like in, in classical economics where we assume we are at a, at a stationary point and everything is uh, converged. Uh, at any time, 
the environment is changing and firms are changing their behavior to adapt. So they're moving in some direction. So that's this gradient field here, uh, grad S. Uh, and the policy pi is, is moving in that direction. Now there's another gradient field uh, here, grad G, which is what the direction uh, towards which we would like the cooperation to go to maximize public good. So uh, yeah, that's uh, just a kind of geometric view of the same thing I just said in the previous slide. Um, but it's interesting to think, so earlier I mentioned that uh, we have this problem between like uh, the, uh, when we design a robot, we're designing a robot, it's like designing the, the legal system for that robot. Um, and, but there's also um, another analogy, which is what's going on inside a corporation. So, you know, inside a corporation is a little bit like a society and you have individuals inside a corporation and, and, and the rules of the game inside the corporation are, you know, setting the, the stage for the self-interest of each person in the corporation, hopefully to be as well as aligned as possible with the, the global interest of the firm. But it doesn't always work, right? So, so uh, in management, I guess um, people are also thinking a lot about that aspect, but it's all of these three problems are related to each other, obviously. Now let's do a little bit more of geometry here. So we have these two gradients. At any point, they might be uh, any policy, you know, they might be pointing in slightly different directions. So that's why I was talking about gradient fields. But let's consider a particular point. Uh, we have these two vectors. And now we really have two situations. Either their dot product is positive or it's negative. So positive means good news. It means that even though they're not perfectly aligned, um, when the policy moves in the direction of its self-interest, uh, grad S, it's improving public good. That's what we want, right? And of course, there's the other scenario where um, the angle um, is greater than 90 degrees, the dot product is less than zero. And now as the, um, uh, agent uh, moves towards its, uh, you know, greater self-interest. Uh, it's hurting the the group. It's hurting the, uh, um, the 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 public good. Um, and uh, we can calculate how much it's hurting. Uh, it's just like a very simple uh, angle calculation. Um, and now, what can we do? Um, so, the the way that we typically handle this in our society and uh, to some extent inside companies um, and to some extent in robots is we create rules, uh, which you can think of as hard constraints, legal constraints. Um, in order to avoid that the agent does something hurtful, we say, you know, you, you, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that and so on. Um, mathematically, we can think of these rules as uh, uh, constraints, and then, you know, in the simplified locally, they might look like linear constraints. Um, now, is that a good way of uh, trying to achieve alignment? And 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 the first message of my talk today is to say, well, maybe not. Up to now, I've, I've been only talking about very general things. Um, and the reason it might not be a good thing is that um, in a high dimensional space, which is really where we are, uh, you might need an exponential number of constraints to really prevent the agent of doing something harmful. And you can see this in, um, in real life uh, as especially when they're very powerful. In other words, they have a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, corporations tend to find loopholes in, in that satisfy the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. And you can have employees that do the same thing, right? Um, so, so that suggests that maybe it's not the best way to get that alignment. But now there is another tool that governments use and also uh, you know, inside companies, um, it's incentives. No. So if you if you give if you give stock options to your employees, it's a way to align the behavior of the employee with the um, the uh, you know global good of the firm. 
And in society, governments can do that too. Uh, they can have fiscal policy that's going to encourage behavior um, in the directions that are good for society and discourage behavior in, in directions that are bad for society. And it doesn't really matter if the incentives are like giving money or taking money away, like grants or taxes, uh, penalties. Um, what really matters, if you think about it from a, um, a mathematical point of view, is just a gradient. Like what's the direction uh, in which the agent can get more incentive? Um, and if that, uh, you can easily argue that if that direction, if the incentive structure is aligned with the, the public good gradient, uh, then you're in good shape. And it's the best thing you could do um, in terms of getting a better alignment. So that's what this picture is trying to say. Um, so we, we need to uh, get that alignment more by incentives than, than by legal constraints. You, either you're in or you're out. That's not very efficient. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, there are other more subtle things that are happening you know, uh, inside corporations. Corporations are made of uh, human beings and the human beings, uh, of course they have their self-interest, but that their self-interest is not just uh, uh, financial. Um, they may, they may wanna feel good about their work. They wanna maybe not act in an immoral way. Um, and, um, and that's something of course that uh, in, in, in managing an organization, uh, you can play to your advantage uh, so that uh, overall the corporation is, is acting better. Um, but, but I'm afraid that as corporations become larger um, and especially when they're public, uh, in other words, um, their um, objective really uh, boils down to maximizing profit uh, and the, the people who are taking decisions um, um, are essentially following the will of the investors. And the investors are not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the firm. They are uh, in a way uh, anonymous, uh, if they, if, you know, uh, stock market. And they, um, they don't realize necessarily that by choosing to invest in a company that's most profitable, um, they are ignoring the behavior of the company that may hurt them or hurt society. So, so this is a this is a problem, and um, it's not easy how to fix this. Uh, but, but I think it's it's worth thinking about. So, for example, if um, instead of the behavior of the company being totally driven by um, the pressure to maximize profit that comes from investors, um, if it was if you know a lot of the decisions were taken um, not just you know by the the, the, the executive team, but um, in a more democratic way inside the corporation, that would clearly um, uh, yield a better alignment with society's um, uh, values and, and, and good, simply because individuals, as I said, tend to be better aligned with society. Uh, so, I mean, not necessarily, of course. Um, so, so that was a kind of introduction. Uh, to tell us that incentives uh, that are like, graded are probably a good thing for uh, managing this, uh, this game between uh, like a government and firms or between the, the managers of an organization and their employees and so on. Um, but now let me focus a bit more on AI. Um, and in particular, uh, ask the question, um, what could governments do to stimulate innovation based on AI um, that, that would be you know, as beneficial as possible for the public good in particular in the long term? So I care about this question because I've been involved in such projects and, um, and I think that society could benefit a lot more from AI if instead of being developed solely for the, um, deployed solely from the point of view of corporations trying to maximize their profit, especially large corporations, um, what if governments could also stimulate the, the innovation uh, in directions that may not have commercial value, but may be important for the well-being of society? 
So one aspect of this innovation question with AI and government intervention is data. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, you know, in, in this presentation several times. So AI innovation is driven in great part by data. Uh, the you know, state-of-the-art machine learning systems, they need a lot of data. Um, and there, and you know, uh, if each corporation uh, generates their own data, but hides it from the others, in a sense, globally, we are missing an opportunity. Um, but but in, in, in another sense, given the current rules of the game, um, you know, it's, it's the rational thing to do for those corporations because of the, the competition that exists. Um, and to make a contrast with that scenario, consider what's going on in academia when it's working well, uh, which is typically the case, um, where academics are doing research and they're sharing their data, they're sharing their discoveries, and, um, and science can progress in a way exponentially faster because of that sharing, right? We build on each other's work. Um, and a good example of that um, is, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the uh, medical space, right? Um, say, consider the uh, use of AI to design new drugs for against COVID-19, which is something I've been involved in. Um, there's not a lot of data at the beginning uh, about this, and um, there is data that is being generated in, in academia, and, and that information is being shared, and that's made it possible to uh, really accelerate, for example, the development of, of the vaccines we have today. Um, if that development had taken place completely inside, you know, behind the closed doors of um, uh, corporations that didn't want to share that, it would have been bad for everyone. So, so it, you know, it's not just a question of efficiency because it's, it's, you know, it's good to be more efficient. It, it can be a matter of life and death um, to, uh, you know, come up with new rules of the game that favor uh, sharing of data um, and more than today. Um, so one way to think about this from an economic perspective is that knowledge and data are public goods. Why do I say this? Well, you can see that they're not like your usual goods um, because um, it's, um, you know, uh, you, can, you can give them away and you don't lose anything. Well, uh, in, in a competitive market, you do. Uh, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way than if, if I gave you uh, half of, of my wheat or something or my, my dollars. So, um, in, and then there's this uh, aspect, why, why public good? Because it, when we share data, uh, when we make data public, everyone benefits. Um, so, uh, it's, if you're the agent, uh, you know, overseeing all this, like government, really you'd like to get more sharing because that's going to help you know uh, all, all boats uh, rise. So um, yeah, examples of this, um, the use of AI for discovering new antibiotics, which is something I've been working on uh, in, in the last couple of months. And um, I believe as one of the greatest um, challenge for uh, our healthcare systems in the coming decades, uh, because of uh, antibiotic resistance, more generally antimicrobial resistance, the drugs we have created to protect us against infections and potentially global you know, pandemics due to infectious diseases, um, they quickly become um, uh, much less useful because these pathogens develop resistance through mutations that make them resistant to, to uh, the existing drugs. Um, so we need a new pipeline to quickly um, come up with uh, new drugs uh, against those variants. And unfortunately, there is no industrial research in pharma or very little to, to discover those drugs uh, because the commercial value is, is insufficient to stimulate them. So that's an example where there's a huge societal need. So for example, it was estimated that 
um, if we don't do anything, if nothing serious changes uh, with status quo, um, by 2050, the economic cost of um, uh, antimicrobial resistance will grow to 100 trillion US dollars. That's a lot of money and 10 million deaths per year. So that's much more even than COVID-19. Um, so there's a really huge societal value to solving this problem, but, but companies are not doing it because it's not commercially viable uh, for reasons that I could explain. But here, what matters is to say, well, there's an important problem. The current market forces are failing to solve that problem. Uh, governments need to step in and they need to invest for the benefit of everyone to fill such gaps. And you have such gaps in other areas like uh, discovering new carbon capture materials. This is going to become profitable only to the extent that governments are going to change the rules of the game by uh, some form of carbon pricing, for example. Um, so what can governments do? Um, well, uh, the traditional way that they have been intervening uh, in areas like this is by providing grants. So in academia, of course, we benefit from that and it kind of works well for academics. Uh, we get grants, but it's not the only thing we get. We get the sort of um, uh, moral value of our work. We get recognition that is not a, a directly a, like a, a financial thing. Um, and because uh, recognition depends on our uh, current work uh, ending up being cited and useful many years in the future, um, we tend to do a pretty good job. Um, we're not just you know, taking the money from the grant and, and spending it in unwise ways. I mean, for the most part. Uh, and that's uh, uh, different from the way you uh, see innovation in industry where um, the reward for doing the innovation comes later only if the, the, the research, the R&D has been good. So there's a long-term incentive um, to do a good job at innovation or research in industry. And if governments give grants to industry, um, they don't have such a strong um, um, motivation to do a good job. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, what can we do? Well, instead of just giving grants, which are good in themselves, they're like de-risking the, um, the, the, the research to some extent, um, is combining grants with long-term rewards. In other words, governments would define performance-based rewards based on milestones. And, and you know, if, if the, the outcomes, if the results of the research uh, end up being useful and you know you, it has to be 100%. It could be that as you make progress towards something useful, you get more and more rewards from governments. Um, that would probably solve the problem um, and kind of play the role of profits. But now there is no profit if um, we're talking about doing something that is not commercially viable in itself, but is useful for society. So, so that another important message of my presentation today is that for public good innovation, Governments should contribute not just to costs of the research, but also some outcome-driven downstream rewards. Um, and so these outcome-driven downstream rewards, it's not a new idea at all. Uh, there's already um, uh, different formulas that exist in, in government uh, procurement um, for things like social impact bonds. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but it, it's something that needs to be more clearly as part of the um, innovation procurement, uh, innovation incentive it's, uh, that governments um, put together, and especially uh, in high-tech areas like AI. Now, there is a slight challenge here. Uh, if governments are gonna give, not just a, you know reimbursement for costs or parts of the costs of doing the research, but also some later rewards, how do they set those rewards? Um, should they set the rewards based on the societal value? So I mentioned um, if we fix the problem of antibiotics resistance, uh, this is going to be worth 100 trillion US dollars to you know the whole uh, planet, uh, the whole of uh, all the countries together. Um, should we give that money to a company that finds a solution to this problem? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think that would be a waste of public money. 
Um, if you think a little bit about it, it's very likely that many companies would be willing to do that R&D for much less. Um, so long as it's pro profitable for them, uh, then they would probably do it. So, uh, so that means governments uh, need to find the kind of uh, correct market price for that innovation, for funding that innovation and rewarding it. Um, uh, at the level that's just high enough to motivate innovators to do a good job. And, and there is no general formula. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, it's gonna be difficult to come up with a general formula for, for answering the question of, you know, what's the right amount of rewards? Um, because each field is going to be very different in that respect. So one kind of class of solutions, which, uh, economists know a lot about, uh, I think, which makes, makes sense here so long as you have multiple corporations that can compete for doing the job, is an, a kind of auction-driven pricing. So governments could propose different forms of contracts, for example, different amounts for the payments of rewards um, and different proportion of the uh, research costs being funded by government versus the company. And then... Um, uh, and then the uh, um, firms could could bid on, on, on these uh, different possibilities. For example, they could say, I'm willing to do it um, uh, uh, and pay for 20% of the cost of the research because I'm expecting those rewards to be good enough for me later. And then we can you know, play the usual auction games like um, the best bid wins, but we, we, we make them uh, pay or receive according to the bid of the second best bidder. Okay, um, so now let's go back to this issue of uh, knowledge sharing and data sharing. Um, to understand how significant that is, I'd like to suggest an analogy. I'd like to suggest that knowledge is growing in a way that's like how capital grows uh, because of compound interest. In other words, it grows exponentially fast. I mean, the exponent might be small for one year at a time, but it grows exponentially fast. Um, and if, if you look at the progress of science, that's how it feels too. Um, so it would be really great to be achieve, to be able to achieve that uh, exponential rate uh, and you know a rate as high as possible um, for uh, innovation going on in um, in corporations, um, uh, you know, to be to be as as efficient as the uh, uh, development of science in in academia. Now, as I said, it's uh, not clear how to do that. Um, uh, in, I'm going to take the example of uh, drug discovery again. Um, the costs of collecting the data that's needed to discover a new drug, and, and especially if you're going to be using AI in the process, is, is, is quite high. Uh, collecting that, that data requires expensive equipment, um, uh, people that are uh, highly paid. And, um, and so if companies were to give away their data, simply you know, make them public, um, it would be like they're spending money that goes to the public good. And that means their competitors can take advantage of it without having to pay for that. And so now their competitors have an advantage over them. Um, and if governments, you know, what makes things even more complicated is that if governments were to impose some form of um, like by legal constraints, uh, say their companies, um, have to share the data they're generating in some drug discovery uh, context, for example. Um, in a way, it would work if that was the only country in the world, because then all the companies would be under the same, um, you know, no one would be really disadvantaged or advantaged by this because uh, everyone would have to share their data. Uh, unfortunately, we are in an international situation where different countries uh, might, you know, act differently. And so if a country were to impose this on, on their company, the companies in, in, in that country, then the, these companies would be at a disadvantage against companies in another country. So it's, 
it's a tough problem. And I, I don't, I don't uh, yet have a completely satisfactory answer to this. But there is an area, which is the area I started with, where I think this can work. So let's go back to the motivation of governments funding um, innovation in areas where companies would otherwise not go. So like, like my antimicrobial res uh, resistance uh, R&D with AI. Um, in that case, uh, sharing the data, uh, well, there are two aspects that make this um, maybe interesting, easier to deal with. So, so one is governments are gonna give money to companies. So in exchange for that money, they can, they can request you know, contractually that they, they share their data. So they, they have leverage here. That's, um, they don't need to change the laws of the country. They can just do it through contracts, which is much simpler and um, yeah, can be done piecemeal and so on. Um, so that's one thing. It's easier to do because they have that leverage. Um, and second, um, because these applications don't have much commercial value um, by themselves, um, you know, the, the, uh, from the point of view of the company, it might not be, you know, such uh, uh, difficult, uh, so di as difficult to accept doing it. Um, for example, you know, let's say they have test assay results for antibiotics. Um, the only other companies that would be benefit from this would be companies also trying to discover antibiotics, but it's not profitable. So they would only do it because uh, they're also getting funded by governments. And so that means uh, they would also uh, be under the same rules. Okay. And then finally, uh, another aspect of the international situation is that uh, governments might be collaborating uh, across the planet to share the cost of that innovation and thus reducing the cost of doing it, uh, you know, uh, uh, by the same uh, proportion as how many countries are, are um, uh, chipping in. Um, yeah, so um, I already mentioned the tragedy of the commons. Um, one, um, one point I want to quickly mention before closing is uh, what makes many of these problems complicated is the, also the temporal aspect. Uh, so whether it's drugs or whether it's uh, it, you know, new devices to help us dealing with um, uh, climate change, the impact of these innovations might be you know, years or decades in the future. So how do we how do we properly value um, those things? Uh, given that we well we don't know there's a lot of uncertainty about that future um, uh, value. And if you look at the now changing to climate change issues, uh, if you look at um, uh, carbon pricing, uh, it's very likely that the current carbon prices that governments are setting in some direct or indirect way are um, insufficient and will grow as uh, populations more and more realize the importance of, of this for their survival. Um, so the, the current price uh, that governance put isn't like a good, uh, a good reflection of the actual uh, societal value uh, of these things. Um, so um, one thing that might help is if there was a market uh, think of it like uh, bets that people would make about uh, the carbon price um, that governments 20 years in the future um, will uh, put. And then, you know, that's just a market that exists by itself. Um, a, it's just a betting market. And now governments could use the, the predictions of that market to, to charge uh, or to reward um, actions of corporations. So I'm going to close with those words. Um, uh, first, a quote from Moshe Vardy in his go to lecture just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, he said, innovation is not a goal. It is a means for societal progress. So this is very much aligned with what I'm saying. And another quote from uh, Benjamin Applebaum uh, in the New York Times last year. Instead of redefining the role of the corporation, we need to redefine the role of the state. In other words, you no know, 
corporations are just gonna go for their self-interest in some form or other. And um, the only like solid way of um, making that better aligned uh, with uh, the, the needs of society is through the state uh, that is gonna change regulations, change contracts, change laws and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Joshua Bencho. Um, I know that your time is extremely restricted. I have a long list of questions, so let me know how many minutes are left. I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, no, um, we, we can go for uh, 10, 12 minutes, no problem. Brilliant. Uh, so I just jumped to the questions from our audience. The first one was, how can any corporate or government programmed robot promote the public good when at present the changing and competing views of the public are not provided to make each decision? That's a very good question. Uh, that's why we need more democracy. <laughs> I mean, so we, we have democracies on paper, but uh, democracy means power uh, to the people. That means uh, everyone has a voice. And uh, we have a kind of democracy, but it's, you know, there's not so many bits of information that each of us can carry to the collective decision. So yeah, you're right. And we need to make our societies more democratic by making sure that the, uh, what's good for as many people as possible is influencing those decisions. Um, there is no like magic recipe here. And, uh, but I see a very positive trend, uh, especially in AI, people are being doing things. For example, in, in Canada, we've been doing a lot of, um, uh, not just surveys, but actually um, consultations with the public to get to understand what were their fears, what were their concerns, um, uh, so as to shape uh, public policy. So there's another question by Laura Kirsten. She asks, if governments invested to fill this gap, wouldn't this simply shift the economic competition from the businesses to the national level? So self-interest exists in the- Yeah, absolutely. So I, I had a slide about this and I kind of skipped it uh, for the interest of time. And uh, yeah, this, it's a tragedy of the common problem. And, um, and, and you know, we, we know how that works. Uh, we have that situation at the international level. We have it in the case of uh, climate change. Um, countries are dragging their feet, hoping that ours, others will do it and so on. Um, and um, it's a, it's a, it, it seems like in, it's intractable, but I think there are solutions. So again, if you go back to game theory to try to think about the problem, um, uh, imagine the following, and I think Europe has been moving in that direction. Imagine you, um, uh, instead, of, instead of having separate deals on um, like commerce and on things like uh, AI regulations or uh, climate uh, agreements, if you tie the two, it completely changes uh, the outcome, right? So uh, imagine you have a club of countries and that say, well, um, if you want to do commerce with us, like free trade and so on, um, a good, but you'll have to abide by the collective rules that we decide together uh, democratically, including that we need to, you know, uh, price carbon properly, that we need to regulate AI or whatever it is that's for the public good. Um, that's the, you know, that's the game. Um, it's like you want to be a citizen of that group, you have to abide by the, the rules, but you also have a voice. Now, if you consider a country outside of that uh, group, uh, now, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, it becomes uh, more subtle. Uh, should they get into the group and abide by this collective rule or not? If the, if the, if the value they get from the commerce uh, with that group is, is high enough, then they will be willing to get into the group as well. So you see that you can, you can, you know, you can do things uh, that I think can change the structure of the game. And, um, and I think we've been going in that direction, not fast enough, not fast enough, but they're, they're, we shouldn't lose hope. <laughs> Definitely not. I have more questions on my list. Just at this point in time, I would like to invite Niels Norderhafen and uh, Komlan both uh, are already on backstage uh, to join us on stage. 
because this gives us more flexibility and whenever you have to jump, you let us know and we, we will continue the discussion about your talk for the rest of the session then. Great. So another question by Stephen Howard is, does this mean government would pre-purchase X number of doses at a predetermined price that the Rx company yeah. would find attractive? And yeah, that's one way to think about it. R&D can previously yeah. lead to da, da, da. and you you already have the answer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I understand the question, and that's one way. Um, and you know, that's a very simple solution to this problem. Uh, but you could have uh, sort of uh, softer versions. For example, normally when you develop a drug, you you have a number of milestones, and then uh, there's risk all along the way. So maybe. Um, you find a good candidate uh, in terms of uh, cellular assays, but then later in uh, clinical uh, uh, phase one, uh, clinical trials phase one, it's discarded for some reason. And then if, even if you go through phase one, maybe it's going to be discarded in phase two and so on. So you can you can give rewards at each step of the way to reduce the risks. In other words, you know, the better you work, uh, your innovation, even if it's not the final thing, you want to get some rewards. So that also reduces the uncertainty, because if you only give a reward at the end, um, the variance on the, the reward is going to be much higher. And so uh, that's going to make the, the game less interesting for corporations, because they also want to reduce risk, not just maximize expected reward. Thank you. Welcome, Niels, also on stage. I just go on with the next question that I received to make the best use of time. So the question is about um, he is capitalism and the democratic institution institutions seem to be failing in ensuring that the construct is used for the public good in general. So democratic right. institutions seem to be incapable of regulating the form of capitalism, which gradually starts serving the interest of a handful of individuals firms. So would you want to, to elaborate? <laughs> this is a pretty big question. Obviously, I don't know. Um, so here's my answer. Um, what we need to do is think about these problems in a scientific way. And that means um, exploring different options. Um, that means being open to different options, uh, trying different things, and, and not uh, taking for granted that you know, one form of governance uh, and economy is, is the answer. But you know, be scientific about what's you know what are the best ways that we can organize ourselves to uh, for the better good of everyone. Right? And I'm I'm optimistic so long as we keep um, the door open to making changes and not take the status quo as the, the end. Thank you, Niels. Has another question for you? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm really prompted by uh, by this uh, answer. I think it's really you know it was a fascinating uh, speech. So, um, my, but the big question for me is you know all these things are very uh, uh, interesting and important. But what exactly can the role of AI be? Can AI also help us getting better governance? Because governments, let's let's face it, and democratic governments included, tend to be quite short sighted. Yes, yes. Can we have any benefit from uh, AI uh, in this field? Um, the current state of AI is uh, far from human level intelligence. And it might take decades before we reach that point. And maybe it's better that we go slowly in any case. Um, so um, it's not obvious how AI can be useful to solve our you know, democratic problems. Um, you could imagine in, you know, in a number of years when um, AI systems understand natural language as well as humans do, that they could participate in the, you know, making the democratic debate more um, uh, rational and, and respected, you know, uh, uh, respectful and uh, inclusive. Uh, the things that we need that current social networks are not giving us, social media, uh, social networks. Uh, and so, um, yeah, but but in the short term, I think it's it, it's just a tool among other tools, technological tools we have. And uh, I think that the main challenges are more about that humans have to think about those things and, and come up with solutions. Of course, they can use those tools, but um, they're, you know, AI is far from magic yet. <laughs> <laughs> Even far from black magic. 
And, 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 and that brings me maybe, you know, if, 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 if you allow me, uh, Catherine, just yes. one follow up question. So uh, I, I, I strongly believe that there is a great future for AI, but I also see that there is a growing suspicion uh, yes. at the public. So what could we do to, you know, alleviate that, to, to take away, I mean, we have to be, of course, we have to be yes. critical, but this for suspicion can actually also be a, a, a major impediment. Absolutely. And I, I went through an exercise like this. Uh, last year, we developed a contact AI-based contact tracing system that in our simulations would have saved a lot of lives and it was never um, you know, uh, deployed because the public you know, was kind of too fearful about privacy issues, about AI as a black box and all these things. So it is happening. It's not just a, a concern, a theoretical concern. And what's the solution? Well, the problem is most people don't understand what AI is about. And they do see, um, say, abuse of AI going on. It's, uh, you know, in, in advertising and what's called uh, uh, surveillance capitalism and so on. And so governments can step in here. They have to, right? They, they have to protect the public. They have to make sure that the rules of the game are, um, are such that, um, AI is, is going to be, uh, you know, as much as possible, something favorable for people and not something that they have to fear. So, so that's one aspect, regulation. And the other aspect is, is, is education. Like we need more people to understand those technologies, understand uh, their limits, understand their potentially useful applications. So that's, uh, it's all of those things are hard work, but that's the only way I can see. Maybe one more question. When would you expect the next AI winter? Because currently we, in Europe, we have a heat wave, not just in AI, also in reality, but very much our politicians are throwing money at AI a lot. Well, at my age, I, I studied at a time when artificial intelligence uh, was an obligatory subject in our studies. And then came the deep AI winter. Right, right. So when would you I don't know. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but... Um... I do think that there's a lot more uh, uh, socially beneficial applications in front of us uh, with AI and, um, and, and economically useful applications. Um, but we do need, as you know, in my previous answer, we do need to uh, go at the right pace to avoid uh, a misuse and, um, uh, you know, there could be ups and downs uh, because there's hype sometimes, people exaggerate, like, oh, this is like magic, it's going to solve all your problems. Um, but, but the fundamentals are that this is going to continue being more and more useful and more and more powerful in you know, the coming decades. So in the long run, there could be ups and downs, but it's here to stay. It's not like in the 90s where, or the 80s where it was empty promises in the sense that there was no like really major application that was game changer. But now we have many such applications and it's just the beginning. I really have to go now, uh, but thanks a lot for having me today. And uh, I hope your, uh, your, your uh, conference uh, uh, is an amazing event and uh, have a good rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Joshua Bencho. A big round of applause from Thank all you. participants on the live <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. And Niels, I think we have lots of food for thought for further discussion. So I have a whole list of, of notes and thoughts. Um, where should we start? So uh, Joshua started with this alignment question. And it seems to be well, deeply involved in, enrolled in, in management, in strategic management, in economics, um, but it always comes back to the same problems in the end. So, so what was your thought about uh, this alignment analogy that he made? Yeah, so, so a number of the solutions that uh, Joshua proposed uh, for the alignment uh, issue are actually, you know, quite well known in economics, like, uh, you know, better use of markets incentives and uh, better use of auctions. And I think that has, that has worked in some cases, but we have also seen that there are very quite often all kinds of loopholes again. 
uh, that actually, you know, make those things work uh, more to the benefits of, of, of big corporations than to the benefits of societies. So um, I think more needs to be done there. I'm, 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 not, I'm not convinced that we've seen the answer yet, I mean, but not that he claimed uh, that he had the answer, that we have to be uh, uh, fair there. Uh, but it, I, I think it was really, I mean, it's, it's um, I, I, would, I would like to be a bit more optimistic about how AI could help us in these things, because clearly these are problems that cannot be solved by just, you know, uh, uh, just economic reasoning. We need to go far beyond that. And, and I would ho was hoping that actually we, we could help, with the help of AI, we could draw together a much broader knowledge base to solve these things. So, um, yeah, that, 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 that's our some thoughts from my side. It's not really a question, but some uh, observations. Well, a real challenge that I see in the end is AI works on data. And as Joshua said, lots of data. But the data we currently have are highly biased. So whatever data we have, it might be medical data from certain regions of the world or management data about from white male leadership groups or production data from the past. So it reminds me a lot of what, again, I learned throughout my studies about management information systems of the 70s where there was this huge investment in management information systems with the idea it would help us decide in the future. But after the hype, there was a winter because people noticed it's all based on data of the past and how can we create the future with data from the past. Uh, so I'm really, really going back and forth between optimism and pessimism, whether we are beyond that because uh, machine learning, deep learning um, really acts creatively on data, or we run into deep trouble due to the biases we see in the data that we currently have. Yeah, I think it's a di dilemma. We cannot wait until we have perfect data. So we'll have to make, I mean, we have, we always do a research. Yeah? I've never, I've never seen the perfect data set uh, uh, in my experience. So you always, you know, make the best of imperfect data for your research. And probably, you know, we need to do this. Well, uh, absolutely, we need to do the same for, for uh, solving societal problems. Uh, but it does, of course, uh, uh, makes it necessary to, to, to be cautious. Uh, because you can really make mistakes based on biased data. That, that is absolutely true. The, the problem is we don't, if, we don't even know to what extent data are biased very often. We, we may su suspect that they are biased, but we don't know. And we also don't know how serious the problem is. And uh, you might notice then from the decision that an AI might take based yeah. on the data, but then it's a little late. So yeah, well, in yeah. an optimistic view, we could uh, say it's a it's a real call for next generation of management research dealing with AI and managing the future of AI. Because well, in, my, in my view, it's already happening. What I see now in in a dissertation research, there is a huge uh, say uh, upturn uh, uptake of the of the uh, AI issues, uh, and and uh, so uh, both in terms of of, of using machine learning to solve a particular uh, a research question, but also in what, what, does, will, what will AI mean for, for businesses? So both topics I think are, are, are very hot at this moment. And of course there are still a lot of you know, unknowns, uh, but I, I, you know, I expect that this will continue for a while uh, and, 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 and will bring new insights. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. And I find it quite interesting that whenever I talk with people from the field of computer science, they usually start by being very hesitant about the term artificial intelligence, because they often want to be much more down to the earth and um, not really um, appreciate this artificial intelligence hype. On the other hand side, I see it as a wonderful umbrella term that allows us to do much more interdisciplinary research because suddenly the problems that emerge need the views of different disciplines. And 
So um, I also experienced the talk by Joshua Bencho as like an, an invitation to to join in to to argue from from economics from management research uh, in order to further develop the ideas that he presented. Well, well, if I may also uh, you know build on that. Uh, so one of my uh, uh, convictions is that actually. It, as we are working with more and more data and with machine learning for, for, for drawing conclusions on the basis of those data, we will also witness an increased nest, uh, uh, need for qualitative research. Um, because uh, machine learning can you know, um, uncover regularities, but cannot, is not very strong or is actually extremely weak in understanding the causality uh, underlying those regularities and, and um, qualitative research actually helps us uncover those uh, 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 causal relations, uh, which are back much more than just correlations, obviously. And so I really think that there will might be a kind of a, a new uh, a renaissance of, of qualitative research to, to help us understand the outcomes of machine learning. Um, that is one of the things that, that I think maybe may be unexpected. Uh, uh, benefits, you could say, even of, of this new uh, type of, uh, of research. I just get uh, from Lisa another question from our chat, which is about uh, that AI for sure requires data and only a few companies detain a systematic process to storage and manipulate data. So uh, the, the Google is mentioned, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and governments in general. So it seems that companies do not have a systematic data governance in, in present, and board members do not monitor data manipulations. And it seems that governments do not either. So I think this is about the gap that happens when some uh, institutions really have the power over the data and others are the well, blind believers or? Well, I... I... <laughs> I think I think there there is a there's a gap between what companies say they have and can do with data and and the reality. I did a project uh, with a PhD student uh, a couple of years ago, and we we talked with big chemical uh, uh, companies in in the Netherlands, and it, is, it was about condition based maintenance. How you, if you continuously measure the condition of a particular asset. A piece of equipment, then you know exactly at what moment you need to uh, to perform maintenance. And they said, "Yeah, well, you know, you make the models. We have all the data. And if we dig, when we dig a bit deeper, it 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 appeared that they either they didn't have the data, or they had them in such a form that they were not usable. Or so it's there's a big gap between what companies think they have or say they have, and what in terms of data and what they really have." Apart from, of course, the the forerunners, eh? so that that you already mentioned, the, these are companies that are, you know, basically built based and built on data. But the average grind of the mill company, I think, doesn't really is not yet at that at that level. And I'm also often asking myself whether it's there are different approaches. One where we assume that AI will take over decision tasks and management tasks and other approaches where AI would take away the tasks we spoil our time with in order to give us time for decision making and management tasks. And of the, the latter, I see a lot happening in healthcare, in medic, with medical data, where for sure we all know we don't have enough doctors and not enough, we cannot enlarge the number of doctors easily, but we could reduce the time load they currently have on workload they currently have with going through data where AI can be a simple tool to reduce this workload and free them up for the really important decision making reflection and further developing the field. That, that, that's, that, that is a possibility, but um, I think we're at this moment still far removed from, from making that into practice. I, I saw a study not very long ago where, so, uh, where AI there was experimented with AI in interpreting uh, radiology uh, 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 pictures. 
and you would say, okay, that is that is a field that really lends itself to it, but it, it didn't really work very well. And that is because, um, and in another speech, uh, uh, Joshua talks about, say, the, the explicit knowledge we have and the implicit knowledge. And it, it appears that the implicit knowledge was in no way actually, so the, the machine learning process did not build upon the implicit knowledge uh, and therefore could not really reach a level of interpretation of these uh, radiology uh, 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 photographs that, that you know, was really helpful for the practitioner. Um, so, but it, 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 give it another 10, 20 years, maybe then uh, it will help and take so, over the routine work. Well, in step by step, it will take over some routine work. So in um, HR, where organizations have these large numbers of applications and at least the sorting and first screening happens through AI. So there are, it's very down to earth and it's far away from the big visions linked to the but high. That, but that's correct, Catherine. But there, yeah, you mentioned exactly one of the things where there's a lot of, um, uh, say, uh, suspicion and unrest and uh, what, what, what kind of biases may come in uh, the application process uh, in that way. And I, 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 I understand that on the other hand, the biases are already there, of course. Uh, we have human biases and we may have uh, artificial intelligence biases. Both of them are not good, uh, obviously. Uh, but it's not, it's not a priori clear that one is worse than the other. Uh, we'll we'll have to find out. <laughs> and they won't simply go away because AI arrives. So no, uh, no. biases are there to stay and grow, I guess. Uh, one aspect yeah. from, from Joshua's talk in the end was for sure really inspiring me when he uh, was basically calling for an exponential growth in innovation. Um, which would be wonderful for an innovation researcher. But as he also asked for, for open science, I was wondering, hey, there was a time when national governments started the patent regimes in order to drive the speed of innovation. And currently we discuss a lot whether we should restrict the patent scheme in order to drive the speed of innovation. Yeah. And so also this link between open science and innovation is an interesting one. Um, and I'm not sure what you, your views are. So I'm very much in favor of open science. I would also be for a much more open publication system. And as an open innovation researcher, open is a, a positive term for me. But where do you see things going? I, I personally think that science already is quite open. Uh, so of course there might be restrictions in the terms that you need a subscription to a particular journal, but uh, you know uh, that is that is an imped can be an impediment. Uh, not so much in our part of the world, uh, in Europe or the or North America, but maybe uh, pro possibly and probably in some other parts of the world. Absolutely. So there it could help. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the patent system is a, is a, is a thing in itself. I, I, you might think that in, you know, there are disadvantages of the patent system that, that we didn't realize maybe 20 years ago. Uh, the whole, the whole uh, uh, problem with the patent trolls, uh, companies that are just built you know, to somehow profit from patents uh, uh, without doing any research. Uh, obviously, that was never the intention of the whole patent system, and now uh, we're stuck with it. So this is something that might need to be recalibrated. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic also has, you know, given new fuel to that discussion, I think. Uh, so uh, how responsible is it to sit on your patents uh, when you have a limited production capacity while uh, we have a worldwide uh, pandemic? So these types of questions of course will return uh, but i think uh, you know the, the point is that that knowledge as maybe innovation maybe too but knowledge at least almost inevitably grows exponentially and then the big question for me is how can we also make sure that it spreads that people know uh, that people that, that there's not a kind of a uh, 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 a division between the people who know a lot and, and more and more and those who do not. 
Thank you, Niels. I think our time is over and we got lots of food for thought. And your final question, I think, ends this session nicely because it gives us even more food for thought. I deeply enjoyed the conversation with you. I deeply enjoyed uh, the inspirations by Joshua Benjo's talk. And I think we do, uh, don't fear that AI will take over, but AI will make uh, management research even more important and give us lots of work and questions and challenges for the future. So thank you, Niels, for joining this discussion. And to all our participants out there, enjoy your next sessions and uh, take all the inspiration and food for thought with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.